The Methuselah star, better known in astronomy circles as HD 140283, is the oldest star that we know of. Its age is estimated to be 14.46 billion years old. Now that might raise some red flags, especially if you're familiar with the Big Bang Theory theme tune. Our whole universe was in a hot, dense state that nearly 14 billion years ago expansion started. Wait. Well, that's right, we think the universe is nearly 14 billion years old, not 14.46 billion like HD 140283. So, that has led a lot of people to ask the question, is this star older than the universe itself? No. Nope. No. No. Hell no. Absolutely not. No, definitely not. So in this video, I'm going to explain how we know it's not older than the universe itself and explain why us astrophysicists just don't even think this star is that interesting. So HD 140283 was dubbed the Methuselah star by people after the character of Methuselah in the Bible, who apparently lived the ripe old age of 969 years old, the oldest of anybody in the Bible. And even that name has led to massive misconceptions about the Methuselah star HD 140283, because it leads people to think that it's the oldest star in the universe, which it isn't. It probably isn't even the oldest star in our galaxy, the Milky Way, of hundreds of billions of stars. It's just the oldest star in sort of our little backyard of the Milky Way, nearby to the Sun. This star is only 200 light years away from the Sun, compared to the 100,000 light years of the entire Milky Way. And that's because we need to know the distance to a star really well to calculate its age. In fact, there's three things that you need to calculate a star's age. The first one is the brightness. We can measure that fairly easily. We just observe it with a telescope and record how much light we get from it. The second is the distance, which we then use to get what's called its absolute brightness. And the third thing is its metallicity. But we'll get to that in a little bit. As I said, we can get the brightness of a star fairly easily just by observing it. So let's start with how we can get distance. We can do this using something called parallax for nearby stars. This is how much stars shift about on the sky as the Earth moves around the sun on its orbit. It's kind of like when you hold your finger out in front of you and you close one eye and then you shift and you can see like your finger move compared to things in the background. It's kind of like almost in that analogy that one eye is like the position of Earth in June, whereas one eye is the position of Earth in December. Now the closer the star, the bigger the parallax, i.e. the bigger the shift compared to the background stars. The further away it is, it sort of blends into the background and the smaller the parallax becomes until at a certain distance it's actually too small for us to measure. Now the reason we need to know the distance to a star really well is to calculate something called the absolute brightness. Now we've already measured the apparent brightness, so how bright that star appears to us here on Earth. But that light will have been dimmed due to the distance that it's actually traveled through space on its way to us. If we know the distance that it's traveled, we can correct for that and work out what its absolute brightness would be if you were literally stood right next to it. It's almost like it, the star's true brightness rather than the brightness that we observe. It's kind of like the same thing that you do when you're crossing a road at night, right? You look left and right and you can see when cars are coming and you can tell how far away they are based on how bright their headlights appear to you. The fainter the headlights, the further away the car is, the brighter the headlights, the car's right there. All right, so we've got the first two things on our list to be able to calculate a star's age. Now we need that last third thing, the metallicity. This is the ratio of the amount of hydrogen a star has to the amount of other heavier elements a star has, anything heavier than hydrogen. So yeah, helium, lithium, beryllium, but onwards to carbon, oxygen, all the way up to iron as well. Astronomers call anything heavier than hydrogen a metal, which at this point I think is just to troll the chemists, but that's the way it's always been, so that's the terminology that we use. So you might be wondering why do we need to know the metallicity of a star to pinpoint its age? Well think about the very first stars to have formed in the early universe, you know, pretty much as soon as possible as they could after the Big Bang. The universe back then was mostly hydrogen, so the first stars that will have formed will have formed from mostly hydrogen, which means their metallicity, i.e. how many metals they had, how many elements beyond hydrogen, will have been really low. Those stars will have then, you know, through nuclear fusion, produced a lot of helium, and then as they ran out of 
hydrogen to burn, they would have then started burning to heavier elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and maybe even gone supernova and produced iron as well. That then was dispersed through space so that the next generations of stars that will have formed will have formed from whatever was left over from that very first generation. And they will have had a slightly higher metallicity, so a higher content of these heavier elements, these metals, and so on and so on and so forth until like the most recent stars that have formed will have formed from an area of space that probably had a very high metal content from all the previous generations of stars that have come before it, producing all those metals along the way. Now we measure the metallicity of a star using its spectrum. So if we take the light from a star and split it through a prism, and we make a trace of how much light of each color or wavelength we receive. When we do that, we can see that there's colors missing. This is the spectrum of our own sun, for example. If you could view every single rainbow to the same level of detail, this is what you'd see, you'd see these colors missing. And everywhere there's a color missing is where there's a specific element that's absorbed that specific color of light. So from hydrogen and helium, all through sodium, oxygen, and all the way to iron. The fact that the sun contains elements as heavy as iron tells us that it's at least a third generation star in this area of the Milky Way, if not more as well. And of course, life wouldn't exist on planet Earth either if it was any earlier of a generation of star, because in the earliest generations of stars, there just wasn't the heavy elements that you need for life to even start. So things like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and then obviously the heavier elements that go into making rocky planets as well. But instead, if we see a spectrum of a star that doesn't have the colors missing that correspond to the heavy elements like iron, and it just has mostly hydrogen and helium, then we know it has to be very old. It has to have formed very early on in the universe. Putting a number on exactly how old a star is though, once you've measured its metallicity and its absolute brightness, is where it starts to get a little bit difficult because here is where you have to start modeling, well, what brightness do you expect if you've got a star of a given metallicity and a given mass and a given age? So that requires you to know, well, given our knowledge of nuclear fusion and the process that goes on for turning hydrogen into helium, how much energy do you expect that to give out and therefore how much light and how much of that light actually makes it from the core of the star where the nuclear fusion is happening to the actual surface of the star where it's then like released into space as well, you know, and it hasn't actually been absorbed or interfered with by all that sort of intervening material and plasma and heavy elements that you find in there. And then you've got to know how that rate of nuclear fusion changes as your star gets bigger or it gets smaller. And so you have to do this for a huge range of metallicities, of masses of star, of age of star as well. You have to know how it changes as the star gets older. And once you've got that huge range of models of all those different values, then you can say, okay, my star I've observed is this metallicity and this brightness. What's my model best fit for how old it is? And that's how you then put a number on this. So this is what Bond and collaborators did in 2013 for HD 140283, the Methuselah star. They measured a really precise parallax using the Hubble Space Telescope to get a distance, used that to get a very accurate absolute brightness, and then after measuring the metallicity, they could get an age from those models of 14.46 billion years, plus or minus 0.8 billion years. That plus or minus 0.8 billion years is what's known as their uncertainty on the estimate of that age. And it comes from a combination of lots of different things. The error on your measurement of parallax and brightness and metallicity, what you've actually made of the star, but then also your uncertainty on the models as well. So how bright you think a star of a certain age and mass and metallicity could be, that will vary and you'll have some uncertainty on that estimate too. All of those collate together to give you this plus or minus 0.8 billion years, which means that we kind of know a ballpark figure, but it could be somewhere in the range of 13.66 billion years old to 15.26 billion years old. That's not a precise measurement in anybody's book, right? That's, <laughs> that's a difference of like 2 billion years, nearly. Now compare that with our current best estimate of the age of the universe, which obviously also has an uncertainty on it. 
13.787 plus or minus 0.020 billion years. That's a whole 127 million years of overlap in our uncertainty on our measurement of the age of the universe and the age of HD 140283. And so, no, this star HD 140283 is not older than the age of the universe. And this is why astronomers don't think it's that interesting as everyone else seems to think it is when they first hear those numbers. Because we know that at the end of the day, it really is just a story of uncertainties and measurement error, which is a very necessary part of science, but it's not exactly the fun part of science, is it? It's actually the really boring part of science. I guarantee you, you show anybody who did a degree in physics this table on how to propagate measurement error and calculate how they all add up, they will shudder in horror. But not only is this a tale of the uncertainties on the measurement of HD 140283, it's also a tale of the measurement of uncertainty on our estimate of the age of the entire universe as well. Because the hilarious thing is, we've got a couple of different methods for measuring the age of the universe, and they're giving us completely different answers that are about a billion years apart. And what's more is that their uncertainties on those measurements are also no longer overlapping either. This is what's been dubbed the crisis in cosmology. I've talked a couple of times on this channel about it before. I'll link a video up here and in the video description below if you want to know more about that. So hopefully now you understand why astrophysicists just don't find this star that interesting, right? And why when its age was first estimated back in 2013, we didn't just like tear up everything and throw it out of the window because it really is just a tale of uncertainties. We know we've got around about the right ballpark figure. We're not precise enough to say exactly what age it is. So no, this star is not older than the universe. Plus, we have to think about everything else we know about the universe and our best theory of how it started, the Big Bang. Our whole universe was in a hot, dense state. So the entire universe was in this hot, dense state. Essentially, everything was pure energy. It was too hot for matter as we know it. So none of the raw ingredients like hydrogen that you need to make stars even existed yet. Plus, our theory of the Big Bang says that space and time itself were created when this expansion started. So there was no before the Big Bang if time itself wasn't created until that expansion started, because the concept of a before, i.e. something happening earlier in time, didn't exist if time didn't <laughs> exist. So with the laws of physics as we understand them, it is physically impossible for anything that's in the universe, made of stuff that you find in the universe, to be older than the universe itself. Of that, we can be certain. Before we get to the bloopers, a big thank you to this week's video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a website and an app that's built on the principle that you learn best by doing. And they have a huge range of courses on all areas of science, maths, and computer science that you can jump into and start solving problems. Their courses are interactive and fun, and they introduce new concepts bit by bit, so that before you know it, you've learned a whole new subject. Brilliant has something for everybody, whether you want to start with the basics or jump into a more in-depth course on like quantum computing. And they have a really good astronomy course as well, so you can learn more about the topics in this video, from the colours of stars and their spectra to measuring distance with parallax. So if that sounds like something you'd be up for and you want to support me and my channel, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, that's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y, and sign up completely for free. Plus, the first 200 people that go to that link that's linked down below in the video description will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And now, roll those bloopers. That might raise some red flags if you remember the Big Bang theme tune. The whole universe was in a hot dense state and nearly 14 million years ago expansion started. Wait. <laughs> I feel like that song is just like burnt into every single physicist's brain. It's just part of a molecular structure now. <laughs> Another thing that physicists say to troll chemists is that you can describe the entirety of chemistry in one page worth of quantum mechanics equations. <laughs> I'm sorry, chemists. It's just too much fun. <laughs>
So I don't think that that would be described as a precise measure, precise measurement. My Sean Connery is showing again. <laughs> right. Well, I think we're done. Bad science story unraveling the mystery that all started with a big bang bang.